Hello everybody, I'm KC and welcome to another edition of Let's Talk About. Today, let's talk about a DuckTales double feature. Since you guys seem to like the multiple episode review covering Della Duck's Return Trilogy, I decided to do it again with a pair of episodes that feature a character. Ironically, another beloved female character from DuckTales, Lena. Given how popular Lena became during her arc in Season 1, it's kind of amazing that she didn't appear in Season 2 until the second half of the season. Although a look at the production code on Wikipedia says that her return was supposed to be in the first half. Ah, Disney Channel strikes again. At least it's not as bad as season one was, in broadcasting or on Disney+. Plus. Well, regardless, Lena's return episode and the other episode this season that features her are both very interesting to me and ones I'm eager to talk about, so once again, I'm gonna give you two reviews at once. Let's talk about Friendship Hates Magic, Oh. And a nightmare on Kill Motor Hill. Friendship Hates Magic is significant for many reasons. Not just because of Lena's return, but it's also the first episode of season two that properly focuses on Webby, which is surprising given how front and center she was in season one. In fact, one of the criticisms of the first half of season one was that there were too many Webby-centric episodes. But I guess it's fair to give other characters a spotlight after Webby got so much development. This episode certainly shows how far she's come, though, in just the first frame by seeing her take a bus to the library. Remember the first time Webby was on a bus? Have you ever jumped a ravine in this baby? Can I try? I'm Webby! Uh... They grow up so fast. Ever since Lena's sacrifice, Webby's been researching how to get her back from the Shadow Realm. Wait, she's in the Shadow Realm? Oh, oh! I know how to fix this. Okay, we're gonna need some questionable Egyptian artifacts and a children's card game. Just believe in the heart of the cards, Webby. I really love the little addition of realizing that Lena's been watching Webby all this time. It's cute when she talks to her and pokes fun at her routine, while it's also really sad and just further emphasizes her loneliness. Discovering true friendship only to sacrifice it and wind up alone again. But things start to get complicated with the third reason this episode is significant. When Webby runs into a girl she clearly with right away, Violet Saberwing. But instead of talking about Violet now, I'm gonna hold off on that and mostly focus on the established character's reactions to her introduction. On Webby's end, she gets along with Violet immediately, both of them sharing interests in obscure history and cultures and even the supernatural. But as happy as Webby is to make a new friend, she's also hesitant to show her true colors when they arrange a sleepover. Now, I can hear some of you rolling your eyes at the premise, but they find a nice way of re working it. Webby's not worried about Violet thinking that she's weird or ashamed of who she really is. That's what made them connect in the first place, and Violet even recognized Webby as one of Scrooge's traveling companions, which was adorable, by the way. No, what she's worried about is when she's reminded how badly her sleepovers have gone in the past. She doesn't want her new friend to get hurt by supernatural threats like her best friend did. Something that is very understandable and a really nice twist on expectations with this almost cliche premise of wanting to appear normal to a new potential friend. There's even this nice moment of assurance Beakley tries to give Webby about her fears. Despite them being grandmother and granddaughter, these two don't get many personal moments together, and I always like seeing little connections like that that help relationships flourish. Lena, meanwhile, is watching all this play out and doesn't trust Violet from the very beginning. At first, it's framed as Lena being protective. After all, the last time some mysterious kid wanted to be Webby's friend, they they didn't have the purest of intentions. And it's amusing how much Lena and the show are very aware of that. This is exactly what she wants you to do because that's exactly what I would have done! Lena's suspicions start to feel more valid when Violet not only starts asking questions about the Shadow Realm and Magicka, and insists on discussing and researching magical rituals despite Webby's initial hesitations, but it's revealed that Violet has Lena slash Magicka's amulet now. Lena's role in this episode of trying to communicate with Webby to warn her is both pretty tense and really funny to watch play out and fail time and time again. We've summoned an evil spirit! Evil spirit? Right. You can't hear me. The mystery surrounding Violet and how much Lena has become beloved creates this air of suspicion for the viewer, and you start to buy into Lena's loathing of Violet that started long before she had any evidence that she might be deceiving Webby. So what is the deal with Violet? Well, before we get to that, let's quickly look at the B-plot for this episode, where Beakley attempts to befriend Launchpad, which for the most part goes about as well as you'd expect. You could not have picked two more different characters. Now, usually opposites 
can attract, especially in comedy, but one plus one never quite adds up to two in this case. The jokes didn't really hit for me since most of it relies on the really easy and kind of immature jokes when it comes to the level of Launchpad's intelligence. Launchpad's dense nature can be written well, but for 80% of this plotline, it's not. At least not for me. I mean, come on a coloring book? But this story slowly starts to improve with the mentioning of Launchpad's biggest obsession because it's a scientific fact that Darkwing Duck makes everything better. Just ask this guy. Man, everything about this sequence is so damn relatable. We've all been in these positions. Realizing someone we know hasn't watched our favorite thing so we insist they watch it right away. Someone showing us a thing they love but not really getting into it. Or getting really, really into it and then having it be over. Leaving a gaping voice in your life where those precious hours of entertainment once filled it, and then filling the void with fanfiction. is the circle of life. Or at least the circle of fandom. Okay, back to the main conflict. What are Violet's intentions here? Is she another spawn of magic of the spell sent to exact her revenge on the McDuck family? Surprisingly, no. You remember how Avengers Age of Ultron did everything in its power to make you think Hawkeye was gonna die? Well, as mentioned, this episode does everything in its power to make you doubt Violet's motivations. Only wanting to talk about magic, having suspicious items, Webby's history with friends, etc. But when Webby finds Lena's old pendant and demands answers, the story takes a different turn. Turns out, Violet was just stunned by the events of Shadow War, having her entire worldview of science and logic change, realizing the world was much weirder and more complicated than she thought. So her only goal here was to understand those forces purely to understand them. This explanation instantly made me love Violet. She's not using Webby to get ultimate power of some kind. She's just a kid who thought she knew how the world worked and then was faced with a phenomenon she couldn't comprehend. And all she wants is to understand it. She's a curious kid, nothing more. And that's honestly really refreshing. Typically when a character like this is really curious about untold power like magic, they're either working to gain that power for their own means or someone else's, or they're too curious about it for their own good and don't know what they're getting themselves into despite continuous warnings. So usually stories that revolve around an outsider trying to learn about magic is seen as a don't mess with things you don't understand kind of thing. But I like that with Violet, curiosity and a desire to understand something isn't shunned but accepted and with Webby even encouraged. And Violet's just a great character to me. She's smart and studious and curious but treads right on the line of the stereotypes that come with this type of character, especially in cartoons. She doesn't seem to have many friends, but doesn't have trouble making them since she instantly gets along with Webby. She knows a lot, but is always eager to learn and willing to accept that she doesn't know everything. She's blunt and proper, but considerate. And the voice actor, Libe Bearer, sorry if I mispronounce that, gives her a cadence that's typical of intellectual characters, but doesn't go into that full monotone thing that Daria made popular. I'm really glad Violet subverted at least my expectations about her, especially being a spy of some kind. We've already done that song and dance as the episode keeps reminding us. Speaking of which, with Violet's help, Webby is able to finally reunite with Lena in just the sweetest scene ever. That is a hug that was worth the wait. But they got themselves trapped in the Shadow Realm while doing that. Oops. Not only that, but Lena still has a problem with Violet, and I don't think that comes as a surprise to anyone. Yeah, Lena was suspicious of Violet's true motives in befriending Webby, but she had a problem with her long before she thought she was a spy or whatever. The episode's pretty clever in having the audience follow Lena to the point where her actions and attitudes seem caring and justified, when really, she's being possessive. And it's so easy to understand because a lot of people have been there. Probably even some kids watching this are going through through something similar. There are plenty of kids out there who have trouble making friends for whatever reason and might only have one. So it can be easy to feel threatened when they make a new friend even when there's no reason to be. These fears are even personified very well through the monster of the week, the tulpas that roam the shadow realm. A creature whose name literally translates to thought form are powered by Lena's fears and insecurities at being forgotten by Webby and cast aside, left to be alone in the shadow realm forever. But in the end, the thing that helps them squelch these creatures is when they put their feelings towards each other aside and focus on saving what they both care about, Webby, with hand-holding and friendship bracelets. See? Friendship is magic. Take that title. And Lena gets to stay. For good. With more hugs. 
I couldn't ask for more. The ultimate resolution to all this might be a bit cliche to some, but I think every show like this should have a story that shows you can have more than one close friend. Kids can sometimes be forced to choose between their friends for no other reason than those friends' insecurities. But this episode and others like it reinforce the benefits of expanding your circle and building bridges, giving others a chance, sharing interests, assuring them how important they all are to you, and even forming friendships that might not have happened naturally. Lena and Violet say they don't have anything in common at first, but they click pretty quickly and only get along more as the series goes on. Everyone wins by giving others a chance. All good classic cartoon lessons. And now Webby's got her own squad. These three have since been dubbed Team Magic, which I am all for. Long live Team Magic. May they share many exciting, adorable episodes together. And luckily they will soon in the episode A Nightmare on Kill Motor Hill. Which starts at another sleepover? Seriously? Have they not learned their lesson at this point? Well, at least they had the sense to have Beakley stand guard. It didn't work, but it's something. As the title suggests, this episode uses another tried and true cartoon premise, dreamwalking. Lena is having trouble sleeping and having recurring nightmares, which escalates when she, somehow, links all of her friends' dreams together. As they wander around the dream world, Lena tries to fight her greatest fears that lurk in the shadows. Again, I know this premise has been done to death at this point, but it's a plot I'm a fan of. It's a well of creativity with the right team, since there are no limits to the absurdity, and since it's essentially traveling through the minds of our characters, it can be a good way to get in their heads and play around with their deepest desires. So before we dive into Lena's issues, let's take a look at what the dream world has to offer. Webby's dream is exactly what you'd think it would be. An island of nothing but dangerous adventures and a talking unicorn. <laughs> All in your dreams, am I right? She literally turns into a version of Scrooge. It's so precious and funny and perfectly webby. Dewey dreams of being the coolest kid in school and basically being what 11 year olds think being slightly older is like. Or being the star of Saved by the Bell. I can't really tell. Either way, I'd say it's pretty in line with Dewey for this to be his dream world. It's probably my favorite of the dream sequences. The gags in it are great and really well thought out and the attention to detail offers it quite a bit of replay value. I always notice something I didn't the first time. Oh, also, there was this. Like cradled by a moon made of my own tears? Who knows what that's about? <laughs> I have some theories. Louie's dream is probably the most abstract of the group. It's not being the richest duck in the world or sitting at the massively successful Louie Incorporated atop a pile of gold-plated hoodies and the tears of his competition. It's being a pampered cat. This is out there and might be a bit insulting, but when you really think about it, it really fits Louie. All he has to do is sit around and people cater to his every woman desire while expecting nothing from him. Yeah, I think that'd be Louie's perfect life. I do also like the detail in the beginning of this section where Beakley is shot from the shoulders down, mimicking those old cartoons where the pets were the focus and the owners weren't really characters and were just there to explain why the animals didn't starve. And Huey... Ah! Why, Huey? Why? Why, Huey? Why? Yeah, I got nothing for this one. Maybe that it's a way to represent how Huey wants to be a more obvious big brother in a group of triplets, but the result is just unnerving. Like, forget Louie is a cat. This takes the cake for the weirdest dream. Dewey's reaction fits mine perfectly. That is where my analysis begins and ends. Oh, and Violet's dream is just to be able to read more. Of course. Maybe an obvious joke, but I thought it was kind of cute, and I think a lot of the more academically inclined would dream of being able to learn and get more work done even in your sleep, or just to cut sleep altogether. There are some days where that would be real nice. Speaking of Violet, she doesn't have as much agency in this story as she did the previous one, but she seems to have integrated into the group rather well. She's certainly gotten used to their world of magic and weirdness pretty quickly, and she's the one who keeps pointing out signs that something is wrong with Lena. She's still observant and friendly, and I am quickly becoming a fan of hers. I'm not gonna point out everything that happens in these dreams, but I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the imaginary fourth duck sibling, Fooey. I'm frankly surprised this has never been a thing. Or maybe it was. Was Fooey the one in yellow in those old Donald Duck shorts? Coincidence? I think not! <laughs> 
correct. Anyway, we got the fun dream antics out of the way. Let's go back to what all this is doing to Lena. The running constant in this episode is that Lena is trying to hide what's bothering her, letting her friends try and have a fun adventure in the dream world, and hoping she can hold off her nightmares until they wake up. Now that Lena's back, she wants to prove that she's a good person and wants to make up for all the backstabbing things she did to someone she now genuinely considers to be her dearest friend. You know, like pretty much every reformed kid on Digimon. During this latest adventure, Lena's worried about dragging her friends into her own issues, not wanting them to deal with any more magical problems because of her. This fear that her friends won't accept her because she's scared she'll fall back into darkness continues to warp the dream world around her in pretty creepy ways at some points until it manifests into the season 2 return of Magicka Dispel. Again, very surprised they held off on this return as long as they did. Magicka is fabulous and devious as always and it is so wonderful to have her back, but it makes a difficult situation even worse for Lena as her fears start to consume her and Magicka spends her time in the climax trying to convince Lena that she is a product of her darkness, that her friends will never truly accept her because of what she is and she should just give in to that. And this almost works because Lena's not sure she's wrong. There's hints of this sort of fear and how quickly Lena felt threatened when Webby made a new friend, but it is unquestionably front and center here. These are fears and doubts that have haunted Lena long before this episode. It just got the most out of control in this one. To the point that Lena starts to get tired of fighting it. Tired of fighting against the idea that she could be anything but the living shadow of a villain. Maybe she's just fighting against her true nature. Maybe she's destined to become just as bad as her Aunt Magica, and she gets very close to giving into that mindset. Even though Lena has let these fears and insecurities consume her, the thing that's been even more damaging to her is not telling her friends. It's understandable why she wouldn't. She's just getting into the groove of living a good life as their real friend, and if she's worried about not being able to change, she'd also be worried that they would reject her if there was even a hint of that being a possibility. A fear that becomes somewhat personified when her nightmare actually turns her into Magicka and her friends attack her. But when everything Lena fears comes to light and she's just about ready to give up, Webby and the others assure her that she's not evil because unlike Magicka, she cares about others and they care about her. Which comes across even when she still looks like Magicka. She even made them all friendship bracelets whose hand-holding friendship magic saves the day again. I'm calling Calling it now, the only way to truly defeat Magic and Dispel is to capture her in a net made of friendship bracelets. Remember where you heard that first. She's dedicated and caring and compassionate, and where friendship is concerned, that goes both ways. It's not just about being there for someone you care about, it's having someone be there for you. Webby keeps saying that Lena's problems are their problems too because they're friends. I don't doubt those fears and insecurities will still be there, but she doesn't have to deal with them by herself. Everyone especially Webby, likes her for who she is, who she's always been. You put so much pressure on yourself to be good, but you are good enough. With that support, Lena is free to be herself and embrace her true power, both figuratively and literally? Yeah, okay, so a slight revelation here. Apparently, Lena now has Magicka's powers, and Magicka's been trying to manipulate Lena's dreams to get her to relinquish that power back to her. How that's possible, or how much of her magic Lena has now, I don't know, but I do not care. This is so cool. Can we have an episode with Lena going to a magic school or something? Please, please, please. Up to this point, Lena's journey has been about discovering that she can be her own person, that she can be free of the watchful and manipulative eyes of her aunt and deserves the friendship that fell into her lap. She's redeemed herself and is now able to find her own happiness and power. So before I go into the conclusion, let's check in with season 3 and see how Lena's doing. I don't have any plans to do a full review of the season 3 premiere, Challenge of the Senior Junior Woodchucks, but I want to look at Lena's role in this episode. Since it's the very first time she plays a truly supporting role for... Violet? Yeah, her and Violet have gotten even closer by this point. Lena in particular being very affectionate and acting almost like her big sister. This might seem quick, but since Lena had nowhere to go, fans were wondering where she's been living. Well, according to Frank Anganes, she's living with Violet. Violet is so awesome that she keeps an eye on this mysterious shadow girl after their first encounter, and then her and her family just 
take her in. This was apparently going to be mentioned in Nightmare at Killmotor Hill, but it was cut for time. While this does throw some delightful headcanons I was attached to about Scrooge adopting another wayward kid out the window, this is such a great alternative, I do not care. Also, Violet has two dads. Yay, representation! Maybe next time they'll get a line. That's my sister from a couple misters. I really feel that Lena's presence in the season 3 premiere shows what these two episodes represent. Overall, Lena's time in season 2 of DuckTales is her completing the journey of releasing herself from Magicka's grip, becoming more sure of herself and her relationships, and being able to create new ones that are just as meaningful. These might not be the most groundbreaking episodes, especially of season 2, but I think it's a good example of doing what they set out to do really well, with haunting and creative visuals, endearing and fun voice work and interactions, and like most of season 2, introducing fun new ideas to heighten the potential of future adventures that will help keep the show fresh. I hope season 3 has even more exciting adventures planned for Lena and Team Magic. Thanks for watching, and I will see you guys next time.